welcome. Um, thank you very much for coming out on this beautiful evening. And I actually, this is one of the few uh, late January um, programs that I will open up by saying it's a beautiful evening, a beautiful winter evening. I'm actually happy to, um, to see it on a little bit of the chilly side, uh, surprisingly, even though I'm from Florida. <laughs> we, we like to have the seasons. Um, I'm Barbara Shatera. I'm a librarian here at the Fletcher Free Library. Uh, one of the things I do here is plan programming, and um, the success of programming has a lot to do with our partners, and Phoenix Books has been a terrific partner with the library, and uh, bookstores and libraries aren't necessarily um, uh, opposed to each other, but they're not always working in concert with one another the way uh, Phoenix has with uh, this library, and I want to thank them very much for their support here and for uh, arranging this particular event and many other author events in the future. Um, I also want to put out a quick thank you to Chris Bajalian, um, who has come here, I believe this is his third time here, um, uh, promoting his books, and our, our readers are uh, avid fans of Chris's, and I, uh, and I am an avid fan of Chris myself, um, but primarily because he is uh, such a great supporter of libraries. Um, he uh, has done so much for libraries in Vermont, uh, not just his local uh, library in Lincoln, but across the state uh, and on the state level, and, and I really want to um, thank him for that because um, we are always in need of, of um, angels out there, and, and he has definitely been one for us. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. Uh, I want to thank Fletcher Free Library for hosting, Barbara Shatara for organizing this event. Uh, we, like Barbara said, we love the library. We love partnering with other organizations that want to increase literacy in our communities, like Phoenix Books does, so uh, really happy to be here. Um, I was on Chris's website uh, this afternoon, and we've kind of been kind of been following him. I don't know if you've ever been onto his website, but it's awesome. You should go there and check it out. Um, kind of following where he's been for the last uh, now since the fourth of the month, and he has been so far. I think this is his fifteenth state that he's been in since the fourth. This is his nineteenth event in those since that time, and um, this is the 20th city, I think, something like that. So uh, I really want to thank Chris for being here tonight. He must be so exhausted from this, no? Okay, he's really good. But, <laughs> you know, I think it, it, you know, it's, it goes to Chris's wide appeal. He's a New York Times best-selling author. He's the Indie Bound, which is an independent bookstore uh, bestseller list. He actually just moved up a couple spots on that for this week. Um, he, this particular book, I, from everything that I'm hearing from our customers, is one of his best and, and certainly is getting that kind of reaction from readers out there. So if you haven't picked it up yet, we do have books for sale over there. Um, I'd encourage you to do that. It's a really interesting read uh, about a topic that is in the news, but I think more than that is the characters that Chris writes about that is why his readers really love him. Um, and you really come to empathize with them, even if you don't agree with them, uh, understand what their choices have been, even if they're bad choices. Um, and I think it's just a, a, a really interesting way to write fiction and people really respond to it. Uh, so I'm not gonna talk any more about that. I just wanted to say thanks once more and please enjoy Chris Bojellian. Thank you, Todd, for that introduction. It is a pleasure, it is an honor, it is a privilege to be back in our beloved 802 for day 19 of the guest room, rock and roll, get your t-shirts, running slime dog of literary capitalism book tour. Normally we begin in Vermont, but this time we save the very best for last. So I've got to give a big shout out, yes indeed, to this wonderful world of books, the Fletcher Free Library, to Phoenix Books for all that you do, and of course, for all of you who have joined me here on this Thursday evening, 
Thank you so much for celebrating what words and reading and books can mean to the soul. Now, this is indeed the end of the tour, not a conscious reference to a David Foster Wallace movie, <laughs> but it is. I love book tours. It wasn't all that long ago that my book sold briskly, but only among people with my last name. <clears throat> I try never to lose sight of that. Um, not all authors do. In the house tonight with us is also the immensely gifted Vermont novelist Stephen Kiernan, also a book tour warrior. If you've not read The Hummingbird, his most recent novel, you must. It is poignant and powerful and beautiful. The reality, however, is that book tours can be utterly terrifying and degrading if you are a novelist. Trust me, it is not always the Fletcher Free Library or Phoenix Books out there. Three moments from recent book tours, not hyperbole, all real. So you understand why it is so lovely to be back here in Burlington. Moment number one. I'm at a really esteemed book tour, bookstore in the Northwest. I'm actually speaking at that city's public library that evening, but during the day, I am brought to the bookstore to sign the stock. And I walk in, and there are no signs of my new book anywhere on the new table. There are no signs of my book in the staff recommend wall. There are no signs of it in fiction. Now, I know it's doing okay because I know that this coming Sunday it's going to debut on the New York Times bestseller list. So ever the optimist, I go up to the woman behind the counter and introduce myself and say, if you've got any of my books, I'd be happy to sign them. And she looks at her computer and she says, yeah, we ordered three. <laughs> Still got them. She then brings me to a back of the back of the store, a part of the store that is so unused and filled with dust that if I were an asthmatic, I would have gone into anaphylactic shock. <laughs> there, at the top of a shelf that neither of us can reach, are the three books, Spine In. And so I say, ever the optimist, well, if you've got a ladder and want to get them down, I'd be happy to sign them. And she says, and this is an exact quote, no, I'd rather you didn't. <laughs> Our readers are very discriminating. <laughs> Moment number two. <laughs> I am in San Francisco, and it's been a lovely event. Now I'm at the table signing the books afterwards. And as I'm signing the books, a gentleman leans way over into my personal space and says, you know, don't you, that J.D. Salinger just died. I said, I heard. <laughs> Robert Parker, gone. I said, I know. Howard Zinn, just died. I said, yeah, I know. And he looks and he says, you worried? <laughs> and then there is this. I am in New York City. I am on a panel to discuss audiobooks. And on my right is the force of nature, Adriana Trigiani, Lucia, Lucia, Big Stone Gap. And on my left is the naturalist, Alan Tennant. He has just published his memoir, Bird on a Wing, chronicling the years that he spent following falcons and raptors as they migrated from Canada to South America. For the first 15 minutes of this panel, it's very egalitarian. Adriana's getting questions, Alan's getting questions, I'm getting questions. About 15 minutes into the panel, however, I look to my left, and I see being rolled onto the stage a carton the size of a dishwasher, and it has air holes. I think of what W.C. Fields once said, you never ever want to perform with small children or interesting animals. I know what is in that carton. And sure enough, my worst fears are realized when Alan Tennant gets out the glove. <laughs> the big leather glove with the ties and the buckles and the stays. And his assistant opens the carton and places onto his arm a proud, majestic, regal, red-tailed falcon. And for the next 45 minutes, 
Adriana and I are completely invisible. <laughs> I could have said, I know the epoxy Trump uses to keep that on his head. <laughs> and no one would have cared. I mean, I'm watching the bird too. <laughs> 45 minutes later, the panel is winding down. I have said nothing. Adriana said nothing. There's a hand in the very back of the auditorium. The moderator recognizes her and this woman says, I have a question for Chris. Stunned, <laughs> I sit up. I place the toothpicks in my eyes and I try to look alert. And she says, you haven't told us anything about your new book. I don't know, how are the reviews? And before I can answer this wonderful, underhand, slow pitch question, the bird, which is still on Alan's arm, poops. <laughs> Raptor poop is not pigeon poop. Everyone in the auditorium can see this, including the moderator, who looks at the poop, looks at the bird, and then says, and this is an exact quote, <laughs> well, we know what the bird thinks of his book. That will never happen to me at an event with Phoenix Books and the Fletcher Free Library. <laughs> um, yeah, bird poop. That brings us to my work, to our work together this evening, the guest room. When my wife read a rough draft of the guest room in bed, she turned to me and she said, wow, you've done it. Breaking Bad meets the bonfire of the vanities. <laughs> I knew what she meant. The book is, arguably, a departure. But my goal is never to write the same book twice. My books fall into two categories. Historical fiction, contemporary literature. Historical fiction, novels such as The Sandcastle Girls, a big, sweeping, epic love story set in the midst of the Armenian Genocide, or Skeletons at the Feast, about one German family's complicity in the Holocaust. The contemporary literature, well, it's, it's books such as The Double Bind and the story of a Kotz social worker who is spiraling into madness after she believes she has found Jay Gatsby and Daisy Faye Buchanan's Bastard Son, or Close Your Eyes, Hold Hands, about a teen girl trying to keep it together in Burlington, Vermont, there are scenes right up there in the mystery section and in the poetry section after a meltdown at Vermont's lone nuclear plant. What all of these books have in common, to go to, however, are two threads, and I believe those threads are intertwined on every page of the guest room. The first thread, when I think of it, I think first of the emotion I experienced when I was watching one particular episode of Mad Men. You don't need to know Mad Men to know this feeling, but imagine the setting. A middle school-aged girl named Sally Draper gets out of a cab on New York City's Upper East Side in the morning. And instead of going to school, she goes back to her father, Don Draper's, and stepmother's apartment. And everyone who is watching that episode of Mad Men knows that Sally is going to catch her father, Don, in bed with a downstairs neighbor. And it is going to be cataclysmic for father and daughter, a game changer, irrevocable perhaps. And I was watching this scene at 5 of 11 on a Sunday night, alone in my TV room, my wife sound asleep in our bedroom, and I was talking to the television set. I was saying, no, Sally, no, no, get back in the cab, please don't go there. <laughs> that emotion, it is dread. When my books work, they are about dread. That's what keeps you turning the pages, wondering if at the end you will be greeted by heartbreak or hope. Dread. In the guest room, I hope, 
is rich with dread. <laughs> the other thread? Well, it's something my 22-year-old daughter observed after she read a rough draft of Close Your Eyes, Hold Hands, when she was 19 years old. She turned to me and she said, Dad, take this as a compliment, because I mean it that way. But I think your sweet spot as a writer is seriously messed up young women. <laughs> and of course, she's right. When you think of all of those books I mentioned to you, think of the women in them, in the double bind, Laurel Estabrook spiraling into madness after a cataclysmic sexual assault, Emily Shepard, a cutter, an orphan, popping Oxycontin tablets as if they are M&Ms, and in the Sandcastle Girls, Karine, Navart, Hatun, all scarred by what they witnessed and what they lost under the searing Syrian sun in 1915. The guest room has another one of those young women. I'm going to introduce you to her in a moment. The book is a novel of suspense, a thriller about a marriage in crisis, two remarkable women, and that one moment you wish more than anything you could take back. It had its origins in August of 2013. Some of you might have read this story in the Burlington Free Press. Got to give a shout out. I see Dennis Redmond is in the house. I see Aki Soga is in the house. I see Mike Townsend is in the house. I see Becky Holt is in the house. These are all amazing editors from my wonderful alma mater, the Burlington Free Press. But it's 2013 now, and I am in Yerevan, Armenia. I am there with my wife and daughter, and on this particular visit, we have brought with us another friend of my daughter's who's also part Armenian, but has never been to Yerevan. She was returning to the United States a day before my family. She was on a 6 a.m. flight to Moscow and then west. And because I'm a dad, I said, meet me in the hotel lobby at 3.30 in the morning so I can bring you to the airport, get you checked in, get you as far as security. And because I'm a dad, I was actually downstairs at 3.10 in the morning because I didn't want her alone in the lobby in the middle of the night. And as I was waiting for her, I saw a young woman, 17, 18 years old, younger than my daughter, and she was paying off the bellman to go upstairs and go back to work. She was an escort. All of us have seen escorts in hotel lobbies, stress that lobbies, in San Francisco, New York, LA. But this was particularly heartbreaking for me because she was so young and because I'm a father and because this was in Armenia. And I began to wonder, is there a story in a young woman such as this? And if there is, what is it? And when you research prostitution in the Caucasus or the Middle East, you are but a razor-thin line from researching human trafficking. Here's the reality. Human trafficking is a $150 billion business. Siddharth Kata at Harvard, who is sort of the expert on the economics of sexual slavery, estimates that there are somewhere between 1.2 million and 1.4 million young women, girls, and boys trafficked across international borders. Here in the United States, one out of every six of our teen runaways is now in enforced sexual exploitation somewhere. When did human trafficking and sexual slavery become a Western phenomenon rather than Thailand or the Philippines? 1990. The Berlin Wall fell. All of the Soviet republics and satellite nations were thrown into economic disrepair. And who is the bottom of the economic totem pole in all economies and all countries? Women and girls. 
So, who are the players in the guest room? There are four. Three Americans and one Armenian. The Americans, Kristen and Richard Chapman. She is a history teacher at the public school. He's an investment banker. They live in a lovely Tudor house in a tony suburb of New York City called Bronxville. They have what I hope is an adorable nine-year-old daughter, Melissa. Richard and Kristen agree it's fine for Richard to host his idiot younger brother Philip's bachelor party. They fully expect that Philip's idiot friends are going to bring a stripper. Instead, however, Philip's idiot friends decide they're going to bring two escorts who turn out to be sex slaves. Two Armenian girls abducted when they are 14 and 15 years old, enslaved for not quite five years in Moscow before they are sufficiently Stockholm syndromed to be brought to New York City as rather high-end escorts. The girls choose that bachelor party to kill their Russian captors and escape into Times Square. So if you are Richard, how do you explain to your wife, honey, don't come home tonight. The house is a crime scene and there are two dead Russians in the living room. Oh, by the way, I was upstairs in the guest room with one of the girls. How do you explain that to your nine-year-old daughter? And how do you explain that to your bosses at the investment bank on Monday morning when you are on the front page of the New York Post? That's chapter one. The next 300 pages chronicle Richard Chapman's descent personally and professionally as the collateral damage from this night grows ever worse. But if his life becomes hard, it is nothing compared to the nightmare that will befall Alexandra, the Armenian girl who is now all alone in New York City without an identity, a passport, or credit cards. The book moves in alternate chapters, third-person omniscient chapters from the perspective of Richard and Kristen and Melissa, and first-person chapters from the perspective of Alexandra. And I structure the novel this way because most of the time, a sex slave rarely gets a voice. I wanted to make darn sure that in the guest room, the sex slave has among the first words and the last. Tonight I thought I would read a portion of chapter one from Richard and Kristen's perspective and a portion of Alexandra's first section. Then I'm gonna turn it all to, over to all of you for your questions about, gosh, Anything. <laughs> and I'm assuming that all of you can hear me. Richard Chapman presumed there would be a stripper at his brother Philip's bachelor party. Perhaps if he'd actually thought about it, he might even have expected to. Sure, in sitcoms, the stripper always arrived alone. But he knew that in real life, strippers often came in pairs. How else could there be a little pretend or not pretend? Girl on girl action on the living room carpet. Besides, he worked in mergers and acquisitions. He understood the exigencies of commerce as well as anyone. Richard wasn't especially wild about the idea of an exotic dancer in his family's living room. There's a place for everything in his mind even the acrobatically tensed sinews of a stripper, but that place wasn't his home. He didn't want to be a prig, however. He didn't want to be the guy who put a damper on his younger brother's bachelor party. And so, he told himself the entertainment would be some girl from Sarah Lawrence, or Fordham, or NYU, with a silly, mellifluous, made-up name, making a little extra money for tuition. He didn't completely believe that, but in some backward universe sort of way, 
he felt a little less reprehensible, a little less soiled, if he was getting turned on by a 21-year-old sociology major with a flat stomach who understood intellectually the cultural politics of stripping and viewed herself as a feminist capitalist. <laughs> Richard's wife, of course, was not present that evening. Kristen had made sure that she and her daughter were at her mother's apartment in Manhattan. The three of them, three generations of females, one with white hair and one with Wheaton, and the youngest with hair that was blonde and silken and fell to her shoulders, ate dinner at an Italian restaurant the daughter liked near Carnegie Hall. The three of them had theater tickets the next day for a Broadway matinee. They weren't planning to return home until Sunday. There were supposed to be no videos of the bachelor party. One of the women's Russian bodyguards told the men to keep their phones in their pants. He said if he saw a phone, he'd break it. He said he'd break the fingers that were touching the phone too. He was smiling when he spoke, but no one doubted his earnestness. So, there were mostly just stories of what seems to have occurred, how it all went from stripping to sex, how it all went wrong. There is only what the gentleman, including Richard Chapman, told the police. The talent's versions, the talent was gone. And those bodyguards, they were dead. Kristen Chapman stood in a navy blue nightshirt in the window of the guest bedroom in her mother's apartment on East 89th Street and gazed south at the lights of Midtown Manhattan. The cotton felt damp against her shoulders and the small of her back. Only moments ago she had emerged from the shower. She hoped the party was going well and Richard was having fun. She and Richard had decided in the end that there was probably going to be a stripper. They knew Philip would want one and they knew his friends would want to oblige. But she figured any woman who took off her clothes in a Bronxville living room was pretty harmless. Good Lord, when she thought back on the way that she and Richard had partied when they'd been in their 20s, when they'd been dating, a bunch of guys nearing middle age, drinking beer, and watching a stripper in a living room seemed downright innocuous. It might not be politically correct, but it was benign. And Richard worked so hard and had so few friends. There were the guys he played golf with every so often. There were the women and men at the bank. But the reality was that her husband was one of those men who spent hours at the office or traveling and played almost exclusively with her and with their daughter. She worried sometimes that he was a little lonely, a little wistful, a little sad. She wondered if he might make a new friend at that party. She rather hoped so. She decided to text him to see how it was going. She had no idea if the stripper was there yet, and for the first time, her mind wandered to what sorts of things a stripper did in a living room in Westchester for a bunch of guys, some married, some not, in their 30s and 40s. She guessed lap dances, though she honestly wasn't sure what a lap dance really was. She'd never been to a strip club. She had asked Richard an intellectual question, not one tinged in the slightest with judgment, whether he thought the woman would be fully naked in their house or still clad in some sort of stripper thong. Is there such a thing as a stripper thong? Richard had asked in return, kidding, but also curious in a puerile sort of way. I kind of think a thong is a thong. Is a thong, Kristen added, recalling the Gertrude Stein remark about a rose. But then she thought more about it. The idea of exotic dancewear, 
and reflexively raised an eyebrow. You do know what I mean, honey, she added. Thong, he answered, but she could tell he didn't believe that. Or maybe he was just hoping he was mistaken. She couldn't decide from his tone. Heaven knows he liked the look of a woman in a thong. He'd certainly bought her plenty of them over the years. But of course, she viewed them largely as foreplay, date wear. Sure, the girls in her high school class still insisted on wearing them all day long, but they didn't know any better. They were still willing to sacrifice comfort for fashion because of course, there was no more disagreeable panty in the world than a thong. <laughs> As Richard himself had once joked, Victoria's real secret is that she's into some seriously uncomfortable underwear. <laughs> in the bed behind her, in her mother's apartment, a queen with a mahogany headboard and Georgian corners, Melissa was watching an old episode of Seinfeld on her grandmother's laptop. Kristen climbed back into bed beside her and started a crossword puzzle. Not quite 15 minutes later, her phone vibrated and she saw that Richard had texted back. Bacchanalian, he had written. Not proud, but I'm hoping everyone leaves by midnight. I expect to call cabs for at least two of Philip's pals. She smiled. It sounded like he was having fun. She was impressed that every word was spelled right. <laughs> Though the phone might have corrected Bacchanalian for him, <laughs> she shut it off for the night. A few minutes later, while her daughter was still awake and contentedly watching a sitcom that had been off the air for nearly a decade, Kristen fell asleep. She would be awakened by the old-fashioned telephone landline in the apartment just before three in the morning. And Kristen knew, oh, she knew, that the odds are high that a call to a landline, to any line, at three in the morning is the ringtone of calamity, life-changing calamity. That call, it is the raven. And now you need to wildly suspend disbelief. And instead of seeing a balding, middle-aged guy in front of you, I want you to see Alexandra, an Armenian girl born Anahit, speaking to you in her fourth language. <clears throat> I was so happy to see New York City. I was so excited in the crowds, the skyscrapers, and even in the men, I saw my freedom. This was my future. They brought three of us from Moscow, Sonia, Crystal, and me. The rules were clear and the money was clear. I knew they might change rules because they had done that before, but you always hope. I mean, I do. This time you hope the deal won't change. This time you tell yourself there won't be surprises. Maybe that was naive. They always changed rules. They always kept you on your back. That's just expression I learned. Often I was not on my back, but you don't need to hear gymnastics. No one does. Anyway, this time I believed them. I did. It might be two years, they were telling me, and it might be three, but either way, by the time I was 22, I would be on my own, and I would be in America, New York City, center of the universe, yes. I knew New York City from movies. Sonia and Crystal did too. Watching movies was one of the ways we'd kill time during the day when we were back in Moscow. Muscovites, a word that makes people who live there sound like cave people, which they are not, loved films that made fun of communism or showed West winning the Cold War, which was before my time. 
or celebrated Getting Rich Really Quick, which was my time completely, many of these movies were set in Manhattan. We learned about the Staten Island Ferry from a movie called Working Girl, which had nothing to do with what we did. But the title, if we had known expression back then, would have made us think it did. And we always watched The Bachelor. We watched it for hours and hours. The Bachelor always had clean fingernails. He seemed gentle. He did not have scars. His women always had straight, white teeth, and they applied their makeup perfectly. Their gowns were gorgeous. We all loved that moment with the rose. Our men never gave us flowers. Why would they? For a while, we'd lived in cottage, as glamorous as some of the places where the girls who were hoping to seduce the bachelor were staying. But unlike them, we were never allowed to leave. We had one hour of sunlight. So, it was like I knew New York City before I got there. All three of us did. We knew some of the buildings so well from movies and hotel room TV that when we saw real things, they looked shabby. The Empire State Building is as big as you would expect when you stand below it for a first time. But on the sidewalk, there's all this garbage, and the men look nothing like The Bachelor. There are fast food restaurants that stink of French fries and grease, Across the street and block away a strip club, Sonia would remember it, and it would be one of the clubs where we would hide. End of the Times Square, there is nothing like the Times Square in Moscow or Yerevan. But the movies had prepared me for the amazing light show made of ads for flat screen TVs, Xbox games, and fancy bras. What the movies had not prepared me for was that a five-foot-tall thing called a Sesame Street Elmo would try and hit on me there and be flattened by Pavel. This poor little man in his furry red costume never saw Pavel's fist coming. After they showed us the city, I thought a lot about two structures on two islands. To the south, there was the Statue of Liberty. I think I had expected more when we stood at the Battery Park and looked at her out there in the harbor with her torch. I joked to Sonia that Mother Armenia, who stands on hill in Yerevan and out, looks out across city, would have kicked her butt. <laughs> and then to the north was the jail, the Rikers Island. They showed us that too. They made it clear that just as they could kill us, a reminder you would think we never needed, but I guess poor Crystal did. They could simply drop us into that jail. They called it cesspool. That was how they described it. The truth is, I usually felt safer with the men who paid for me than I did with any of our daddies or the white Russian or the guys who protected us like Pavel. Even my house mothers could scare me. It was on my 21st night in America that everything went to hell. I mean that, to hell. First, Sonia and I learned that Crystal was dead. They'd killed her, our Russian daddies, that is. And then Sonia finally lost her mind. I saw it coming that night, her going totally crazy. But I thought she was going to make it through the party for The Bachelor. Nope, I don't know. Maybe we had both lost our minds years ago, probably. But this was the night when Sonia went wild. She went wild and stabbed Pavel because he and Kirill were the muscle who had shot baby Crystal and disposed of her tiny body God alone knew where. Here's a memory that surprises me. I saw a bunch of Barbie dolls in this little girl's bedroom that night at the house where they had taken us. They were in a big plastic trunk. 
The dolls had reminded me of my own collection of Barbies when I'd been a kid, and I still think of that other girl's Barbies sometimes. It was a few minutes after the best man had brought me downstairs. The Barbies were maybe last thing I would notice before I would see Sonia on the back of that bastard named Pavel. Her legs were wrapped around his belly and her left arm was hugging her chest, his chest. His right arm was like a piston with a carving knife in it and she was plunging the knife over and over into his neck. That is an image you do not forget. Somehow, until that moment, I had kept it together that night at the party. I was scared not to. I did my job. They had told us what they had done to Crystal and then put us in the car and driven us out to Westchester to work a private party. The party was for a bachelor, but the man getting married was nothing like the bachelors we had seen on TV. Oh, he was handsome. He had nice eyes and he was always laughing, at least until he saw Pavel getting killed. But he was not the type who was ever going to get down on one knee and give girl a rose. I have been around enough men that I can tell. Maybe his brother, Richard, best man was, but he was twice my age. And the other men at party, most were the kinds of dudes who only had girls like us when they paid. I did what they wanted. I even smiled and played along as if it was just another night and another party because I knew Pavel and Kirill were watching. But Sonia, she was just biding her time that evening. She was pretty sure they were going to kill her too after the party. She told me that later. But by then, we were gone. By then, we were running for our lives. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. I love, I love our 802. Um, the first question is the hardest. So whoever asks the first question gets a t-shirt. And guys, just keep your hands down. Um, I'm not kidding. I've done this now 19 times. And I don't want to go into sex role socialization in our country, but 17 times the first hand was a man. And I only have women's sizes. OK, you're getting, you went up here. Thank you. What's your name? Ellen. Hi, Ellen. It's good to see you again. Thank you for being here. Is Grace Experience going to do the audio for this? Ellen is utterly amazing. Um, Ellen wants to know if my daughter, Grace Experience, is going to read the audio of this book. She read the audio of Close Your Eyes, Hold Hands. As a matter of fact, she did. Um, Grace Experience and an actor named Marshawn Marno together read the guest room. Marshawn Marno reads the third person <laughs> omniscient chapters. And Grace Experience brings Anahit, or Alexandra, the Armenian sex slave, to life in the alternate chapters. And she is way better at an Eastern Armenian accent than yours truly. Um, <laughs> thank you. It is wonderful to have you here. Wear that with pride. I, will. I know it's supposed to be like zero degrees tomorrow. Wear it anyway. <laughs> yeah, hello, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. I have a and what's your name? Hi, Dana. Hi, Chris. So uh, to, get, to make this material authentic, you have to get really, really close to the subject matter. And as I was listening to you describe what inspired you to write it and realizing the research you would have had to have done, I wondered, how do you, how do you handle it? You have to really get into those characters. So how do you manage what it must have opened you? The question is this. When you're doing, what kind of research do you do and, and what kind of emotions does it evoke in you? First of all, a confession, I probably do dramatically less research for all my books than you think I do. But I'm very flattered by the notion of authenticity because you do have to make the books authentic. As John Gardner wrote, you never want to wake your readers from the fictional dream. So yes, um, I did speak to a lot of people in a number of countries. I did read a lot of the primary and secondary sources. But the reality is this, if you want to read about human trafficking, I would suggest you read Siddharth Kata's 
non-fiction investigation into it. I write what I hope are books that keep you relentlessly turning the pages with characters you care about. The one footnote I will add, though, because um, Dana is driving at this notion of compartmentalization. And sometimes I do have to compartmentalize, big time. In this case, it was not simply that I was writing about human trafficking, the ultimate human rights violation. But I was also writing about an Armenian girl. I was most recently back in Armenia at the very end of September. And among the places I went was a place called Merdun. It's called Our Home. It is for Armenian girls who've aged out of the orphanage system. And I spent the day with 18 of the young women there, and they were courageous, beautiful, and smart. And some of them have endured things that hopefully we will only experience in fiction. Did not mean to make that a conversation stopper. <laughs> yes, while well, we were just going right down the line, Ellen to Dana to... Marilyn. Hello, Marilyn. Hi. So having said what you just said, do you, on the other hand, I'm imagining that you hope that this book brings a different, brings attention to the issue of sex trafficking, which is so huge but from a different perspective, and in some ways from a perspective that people, be, because it's fiction, because people become engrossed in the characters, it's very different than reading the straight facts. It is, yeah. That you suggested. Yes, Marilyn is pointing out something that Gabriel Garcia Marquez has observed. Often, often, we get a deeper truth from fiction than nonfiction. That doesn't mean that we do not need desperately the Burlington Free Press, because obviously we do. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, anyone else who's in the house tonight from the Burlington Free Press. But, or, you know, alumni of the Burlington Free Press. But often we discover truth in fiction, and it's a different kind of truth. For example, um, I wrote the double bind about the homeless. Got to give a shout out to Rita Markley, to Becky Holt, both with Cots. And I really hope that a book like The Double Bind showed people that the homeless have often led lives that are vital and vibrant and interesting before, for whatever the reason, everything went to hell. The Sandcastle Girls is a novel about the Armenian Genocide. And I think if I had written a nonfiction history of the Armenian Genocide, it would have been read by people whose last names are Bojalian. Um, but, but, you know, not a lot of other people in Lincoln, for example, would have picked that book up. But it was a love story. And I don't think a day goes by, three and a half years after that book was published, when I don't hear from readers around the world on my Facebook page who say, I knew nothing about the Armenian Genocide until I read your novel. So yes, I hope that the guest room raises awareness of human trafficking. I also hope, however, it causes people to fall in love with Alexandra as a character, to wonder about Kristen and Richard's marriage, and to stay up, you know, you know that great shirt, you know, I was late for work because of one more chapter, that there are a lot of people, you know, one more chapter in this book. And not simply because I've got a daughter who just graduated from a really expensive college. <laughs> Hello. Hi, what's your name? Sister Pat. Sister Pat, hello, it's good to see you again. Lovely to see you also, thank you. Uh, you know, you mentioned two or three times at least that, you know, you are a father, and once you become aware of a situation so uh, desperate or so horrible, how does that impact your life for you to make some, to help to make a change in the area where you live? We know that human trafficking is a problem here in Vermont, uh, both labor trafficking and sexual trafficking. So does all of your knowledge, you know, push you to do something? Does all of my knowledge push me? to do something. You know, I've written 18 books. A lot of them have an important social issue. All of those social issues I've learned about while researching them have stayed with me, and all of them have reminded me of one, how blessed I am, and two, how I have a moral obligation to give back, yes. Hello. Hi, my name's Lydia. 
Hi, Lydia. Um, I wonder, in the process of the many books you've written, and probably more books that are still bobbling around waiting to be written, do you usually get an idea and then focus on that like a laser and get that process out? Or do you sometimes have like different ideas bobbling around that haven't come to fruition yet, but they're sort of on the back burner cooking until you figure them out? The question is this. Do I usually have ideas bobbling around in the back of my head? Or what am I, you know, do I have multiple book ideas that I'm thinking about and I need to figure out which is best? Um, no, I've usually got my next book in mind and I work hard on that. Now, there is usually a gestation period when I finish a book when the idea is coming together. Once I have the first sentence, I will usually write 100 pages very quickly. And then, as Ann Patchett has observed, the book will try to kill itself. <laughs> Books always try to kill themselves somewhere on page 100, because that is when you realize that your talent is not commensurate with your vision. <laughs> so then you are slogging your way through to the end. And I've got to give a shout out to two other people. And you see, you know, if you hang around with me long enough, I will give every one of you a shout out because <laughs> I'm so great. Okay. There, are, there were points in the guest room when I was really struggling. And there are two gentlemen in the audience tonight who were instrumental in helping me not allow the book to kill itself. We'll go here and then here. First of all, my friend Andrew Furch is in the back. And Andrew and I work out at the gym together twice a week. And I can't tell you how much he had to listen to me talk about why is um, the tension flagging in the middle of the book. And he was instrumental in bouncing ideas around with um, and making sure that, that I didn't drop 160 pounds on my neck. So thank you, Andrew. And also, Stephen Kiernan. Stephen and I bike a lot. And I can't tell you how many times that um, I would ask him about different endings in, of the guest room. And he was an invaluable, not simply ear, but counsel for you know, that as well. Hello, we'll go there and then there. Hi, I'm Jess. Hi, Jess. Hello. It's good to meet you. Jess Reeds? Nope. Jess? Uh, saucy Girl. Saucy Girl, Jess. Okay. So wrong was I, but it's great to meet you, Saucy Girl. Oh. We tweet. Yes. <laughs> I'm wondering what's next. A t-shirt for you. <laughs> any, any woman whose Twitter handle is Saucy Girl gets a t-shirt. Well, here's the, here's the irony. They're all mediums. <laughs> so, OK, and what's your question, Jess? What's next? What's next? The next book you will see from me is set in Burlington, Vermont. Woo! And um, as a matter of fact, one of the critical scenes is set at a bakery across the street from the Fletcher Free Library. It is about a particular form of parasomnia called sleep sex. And a 47-year-old woman, a mother of two, who one August night, when her daughter Liana is home from college, and her 12-year-old daughter is, of course, always home, and her husband is at a conference in Iowa, sleepwalks into oblivion. She just vanishes. It is the summer of the year 2000, and now in 2017, Liana, nearing 40 and a mother herself, begins to understand the mystery of her mother's strange, remarkable disappearance before she started her senior year of, high school, of college. It's called The Sleepwalker. That's the next one. I don't know what the so sister pat. I don't know what the social issue is in that. Um, yeah. Whenever, whenever our presidential candidates are discussing the big issues, and have you noticed how little time they ever spend on children, on human rights, on global climate change, on education? Anyway, but they're never talking about sleep sex. <laughs> Hi, Becky. Becky edited me for years. <laughs> okay, so here's my question. So my husband, Scott, 
Spins is probably sick tonight. But we both read the guest room, and it sparked some very interesting husband-wife debate. I'm so glad. So my question to you is, is that something that you and your bride have debates, particularly about this one, or another one, and other books, about the characters and the decisions a husband and maybe a maid, and how the wife reacted? <laughs> Becky asked the love Becky asked a really important question. If you read all the reviews of this book, they talk a lot about human trafficking and sexual slavery. The principal issue that confronts Kristen and Richard is not sexual slavery because they don't know Alexandra's story at the time. The issue that confronts the husband and wife is this. What's the line that's the demarcation line between it's okay and you're sleeping on the couch forever? Yeah. <laughs> For example, and this is actually one of the things, you know, they're arguing and they're debating, and that Kristen is debating with her best friend, which, you know, while her husband is sleeping on the couch. Um, a strip club. Why do guys go to strip clubs? And what is that creepy herd mentality that leads men in groups to do things at strip clubs that they would never do alone. Why is it okay in some marriages for a guy to get a lap dance from a naked woman half his age, but it's not okay if she kisses him? What are these lines? And that is among the things that Kristen and her husband, and, and I hope the novel debates. I do not have the answers. I am not Dr. Drew. <laughs> I simply put it out there for book groups. I'm in favor of it. And what's your name? <laughs> Can you share a couple of the big picture strategies that you use when you're developing characters? Yeah. You have your, your story in place, and you're deciding how Question is character development and big picture. How do you develop characters? And I'm just going to read you one or two sentences. Wait, do you, we all know Tina Fey's remarkable imitation of Sarah Palin. It's like she's getting another chance. <laughs> it's good TV. And it, don't, you know, it only helps the good guys if that happens. Um, all impersonators, comedians, um, always get in character by one line. When I was writing Midwives, about a midwife on trial for manslaughter, I always found Connie Danforth's voice by remembering this sentence. I used the word vulva as a child the way some kids said butt or penis or puke. It wasn't a swear exactly, but I knew it had an edge to it that could stop adults cold in their tracks, and I was back with Connie. For this book, I always would remember the first sentence I wrote for Alexandra. And to go back to character development, this appears on page 284, and it's the first chapter I wrote of this book. Because I was trying to understand who Alexandra is, and I knew how old she was, I knew she was from Armenia, and when I did the math of her age, I thought of a particular recent seismic event in the history of Armenia. And so this was how I would always return to Alexandra. On Wednesday, December 7, 1988, my father and grandfather were stealing two boxes of wristwatches for Communist Party official, very big deal guy. Very big deal guy. That was how I always remembered Anahit, or Alexandra. And I mention that because that, I began by writing her backstory. What was her childhood? Um, what was Yerevan like when she was a girl? What was, um, and you know, no, you two know, I'm sure, the date I'm talking about. You know, it's the Gumadi earthquake. You know, what was Gumadi like in December 1988? And that's how I begin, usually, figuring out a character's childhood, backstory. There are references to Richard and Philip's childhood in this book that appear toward the very end. Who came really far to be here tonight? How far did you come? You're from Eden, Vermont. Anyone further than Eden? 
Pardon? Oh, uh, well, okay, and well, okay, and, um, I forgot your name. Carla. Carla. Okay, you're going to bring this back to Meriden, New Hampshire. <laughs> There's New Hampshire and Vermont at the very bottom, saving the best for last. <laughs> We've got one last question. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering if you felt that an author, or uh, he or she, has an obligation to leave its, his readers with some hope. As a novelist, do I feel an obligation to leave my readers with hope? Absolutely not. <laughs> I am perfectly, I, you know, I mean, I, their entire blogs and websites, H-E-A, happily ever after. And I get slammed, and it's fine, I get slammed on some of the online book places and Goodreads because I do not always give an H-E-A, a happily ever after after. And that's, sometimes my books have an H-E-A, and sometimes they have heartbreak. The reality is that life, as is rich, unfortunately or fortunately, with heartbreak as it is with hope. As Thomas More has observed in Care of the Soul, sometimes the soul simply needs to wear black, sometimes the soul simply needs to wear gray, and you need to appreciate that. And he's not trying to celebrate clinical depression. He's simply realistically pointing out that our world is complex for reasons that are beyond our ken. And with that, I want to give a shout out to, first of all, I want to give a shout out um, to Phoenix Books, to Todd, to the entire team at Phoenix Books. Um, I've got to give a shout out to anyone who's here from the Burlington Free Press, my wonderful alma mater for 23 and a half years. I've got to give a shout out as well to the people here from Cots and Spectrum. And I've got to give a shout out, last but not least, to the, to all, well, to the Fletcher Free Library. Um, I gave you some terrifying statistics in the course of this evening. I want to leave you with a good news statistic. And it is a testimony to all of you who are here tonight, for which I thank you. And the number is this. There are still more public libraries in this country than there are McDonald's fast food franchises. I thank all of you.